Chapter 7. Four days have passed since Polly Rankin left town. Today, Cal and I placed another sack of groceries on Zachary Beaver's steps. We've been here an hour, and he still hasn't opened the door. We wait and wait. I wonder if we wait to make sure he picks up the groceries, or to get another glimpse of him. At least today, we came prepared, armed with a sugar daddy apiece, jawbreakers and M&Ms. Our teeth sticky from the caramel, we talk about Polly Rankin. We even make up his history, where he was born and how he ended up as a sideshow owner. First, we have Polly, figured out as a bank robber who uses Zachary Beaver to distract the law. Then, we have him dodging a lone shark. Finally, we decide he kidnapped Zachary and is hiding out from an orthodontist because of an unpaid bill. While we wait, Malcolm's little brother Mason and four other chubby third graders show up with sticks in their hands. Unlike Malcolm, Mason is tough and the leader of his bully pack. Each kid takes a side of the trailer and starts hitting it with sticks. Over there, pounding, Mason yells, Hey, fat boy, show your face. Something boils inside me. I remember when kids like them beat up on me just because they could. I wouldn't snitch, and since Dad was against it, I wouldn't fight back either. But today is different. Today we're soldiers fighting for Zachary. Thinking fast, Cal and I climb down the ladder and scoop up rocks from Ferris's rock pile out back. They're not big rocks, but from the roof, they could sting the little brat's arms, backs, and behinds. Using our shirts as baskets, we carry the rocks to the roof. Cal and I stand next to each other, our legs apart like camera tripods, our arms set in pitching positions. Ready? Aim. I focus on Mason's butt. Fire. My rock sails through the air and hits a perfect target. Mason's hands fly to his porky bottom. Ow! He looks up at the roof, shading his eyes with one hand. When Cal sits, when Cal hits Simon Davis's leg, Simon takes off crying, his hand pressed against his thigh. Cal trots in place, and this little piggy went wee 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 all the way home. I throw again, this time aiming at James Ruth Rutherford's arm. I miss, then I hear it, glass breaking. The window shatters and the boys scatter in different directions. Run, yells Cal, and we both do, leaving our bikes next to the ladder. It's Thursday and I wake up to the radio DJ yelling, one more day until TGIF. Two things weigh heavy on my mind, Zachary's broken window and mom's big night tonight. Nashville time is one hour ahead of us, but she's probably sleeping in. I picture her lying in a dark hotel room, eye mask covering her eyes. Dad's worn out socks on her hands to lock in her Avon hand cream and empty orange juice cans she uses for rollers crowded on her head. It's the best way, she says, to, to get big hair. I say it's the best way to get a big headache. Since summer nights are usually cool in Antler, we sleep with the windows open and leave them that way until noon. But this morning, the air conditioner is already running at full speed. So I get up and shut the window. Just as I'm about to flick the lock, I see the sheriff's car pull up in the front. Sheriff Levi gets out and walks toward our house. Duke hangs his head out the window, his tongue draping from his mouth. My stomach plunges. Zachary Beaver must have squealed. Maybe he saw us running away. Or it might have been nosy Erlene looking out her real estate office window. She has a full view of the trailer from her desk. I thought real estate agents answered the phone and showed homes to people, but Erlene seems to do anything but that. Once I walked by her office window and found Erlene with her feet propped up on the desk painting her toenails. Cotton balls stuck between each toe. From the living room, Dad calls, Toby! I feel sick. I yank on a pair of shorts and run downstairs. Sheriff Levi's arm his arms are folded across his chest, and except for his usual eye twitch, his face looks blank. He pulls off his hat and rakes his fingers through his wavy hair. I check out Dad's face, but it doesn't tell me anything except he hasn't shaved yet. Toby, Sheriff Levi has something to ask you. He's heard. Maybe I should confess, but Cal would get in trouble, and I'm not a snitch like Malcolm. Sheriff Levi clears his throat, and his right eye twitches like crazy. Toby, I have a favor to ask you. My stomach feels like a glob of lava in a lava lamp, slowly floating up toward my throat. Toby, reckon you and Cal could accompany me to that slide sideshow trailer? I don't know what to say. My knees shake and the sheriff's eyes twitches. 
Toby, Dad says. The sheriff is asking you something, sir. I need to find out what those fellas' plans are. And since he's just a kid, I don't want to scare him or anything. Seeing a sheriff at your door can be intimidating. You know what I mean? He continues explaining. Since you boys are about his age, maybe he'd relax a bit, open up, and tell me the whereabouts of that other guy. The dairy maid has been mighty patient with them parked out front. Before he left, that sideshow fella paid them cash for the water and electricity hookup, but he said it would only be for a few days. Yesterday, Ferris got an envelope in the mail from the, that guy with money for some meals for that boy. It had a San Francisco postmark, but no return address. Now the folks at the dairy maid want to know what's going on. Don't blame them one bit. And well, it's my job to make sure strangers have a good reason for a sticking around antler. Sheriff Levi doesn't mention the broken window. Bringing him straight to Zachary Beaver's door would be like asking me to pick out the electric chair for my own execution. Zachary probably assumes we broke it since he caught us peeking in it a few days ago. Tobias, Dad says, raising his eyebrow, the sheriff is waiting for your answer. I have no choice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be ready in a second. Duke rides shotgun in the front while Cal and I ride in the back seat of the sheriff's office. I hold a sack of bell peppers and green onions Dad packed for me to give to Zachary. Cal acts like we're going on a field trip to Disneyland. I feel like I'm attending a funeral. Mine. As we pull up in the front of the trailer, I check out our bikes still leaning against the side of the Bolarama. Sheriff Levi parks his car and Cal bounces out. I take my time. As we walk up to the trailer, the sheriff looks toward the broken window which is now covered with wagabag grocery sacks. He tilts up his hat. Wonder how that happened. After the sheriff knocks on Zachary's door, we wait for Zachary to answer. When he doesn't, I'm thinking, good, maybe we can leave. But Sheriff Levi knocks again and hollers, Mr. Beaver, Sheriff Levi Fetterman, here, I need a minute of your time, please. The door slowly creaks open a few inches and Zachary peeks through with one eye. He huffs, beads of sweat rolling down his face like he ran the 50-yard dash. The sheriff clears his throat. Mr. Beaver, sorry if I woke you, but I need to ask you a few questions. I brought along a couple of my young friends. This is Toby and Cal. Zachary's eyes narrow, and I know he remembers. I hold my breath, waiting for his finger to point our way, but he only nods and says, We've met. Can we come in? asks Sheriff Levi. Zachary swings open the trailer door, and we step inside. The smell of lemon pledge makes me think back to the first day Zachary arrived. He's wearing a long red nightshirt like I saw in The Night Before Christmas. The ball of Zachary's right foot is wrapped loosely with gauze. Malcolm wears a size 12 and Zachary's feet look a lot bigger. He wobbles across the room, the floor creaking with each step and flops on the love seat, his bottom covering both cushions. He doesn't ask to sit down, but there's no place to sit anyway. The plexiglass panels rest next to the wall, folded like an oriental screen. I see the fabric panel hanging at the other end of the trailer and wonder if the bathroom is behind it. Sheriff Levi leans against an empty space on the wall. Cal looks around, his eyes casing out the place, and I can see his fingers itching to touch something. I take deep breaths through my nose, and I try to look relaxed. In one hand, I hold the sack of vegetables, but I don't know what to do with my other hand. Finally, I let it hang at my side. Sheriff Levi glances around. Nice little place you have here. You got about everything you need. It'll do, says Zachary. The sheriff walks over to the window with the bags taped over it. Looks like you have a problem with that window, though. Know anything about that? I hold my breath, concentrate on the floor, and pretend and prepare for the axe to fall. Zachary stares at us, yawns, and locks his hands be behind his head. I guess some kids did it. Well, I'll drop by later with somebody who can fix it for you. My heartbeat slows and my breathing returns to a regular pace now that I know Zachary doesn't have a clue it was us. Toby and Cal should be about your age, Sheriff Levi says. How old are you fellas? Thirteen, we say together. I'm fifteen, says Zachary, and the way he says it sounds like he thinks fifteen is as old as thirty. That a fact, says the sheriff. Zachary just sh stares. Sheriff Levi folds his arms and clears his throat. Mr. Beaver, you don't sound like a Texan. I'm from New York, New York City. Ever heard of it? Sheriff Levi grins. Kind of a jokester, aren't you? He looks down at Zachary's foot and he, his smile drops into a frown. What happened to your foot? Zachary covers his injured foot with his left one. It's okay, I just stepped on a piece of glass. 
The sheriff kneels in front of Zachary like a shoe salesman. You better let me take a look at that. It's okay, Zachary snaps. Sheriff Levi stands and steps back. All right, but I'm sure the doctor at the clinic would be glad to take a look at it. Zachary glares. Sheriff Levi clears us through. Where is that other fella from? The young man you are traveling with. Polly? He's from Jersey. Is that where he is now? No. Where he is, son? He's looking for another act to add to our show, but I don't know where he is. Zachary frowns at Cal, who is lifting the lid off the gold box. Put it down. My mom gave that to me. Cal lifts a black book out of the box. It's just a Bible. It's not just a Bible. My mom gave it to me when I got baptized. Cal flips to the front pages. Cal, put the boy's Bible down, Sheriff Levi says in a gentle tone. Cal slaps the Bible shut and returns it to the box. I'm wondering why Levi let Fetterman ever became sheriff. He's too soft, and I can tell he hates asking these questions by the way his eye twitches, and he keeps clearing his throat. Where are your parents? Sheriff Levi asks. Rosemont Cemetery. How's that? Dead. Sheriff Levi clears his throat, and his eyes look like it's going to take off. Sorry about that, son. Life can be tough. I'm not your son, Zachary says. The sheriff swallows. Well, of course not. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Who is your legal guardian? Polly Rankin's my guardian. Sheriff Levi grimaces, and his voice becomes firm. I see. Well, I hate to break this to you, Mr. Beaver, but if Mr. Rankin doesn't return in a week, I'm going to have to take some sort of action. I really should be doing it now. This isn't a campground, and the court would view you as a minor who has been left unsupervised and abandoned. Polly will be back. He always comes back. How do you know? The sheriff asks. I'm his bread and butter. Sheriff Levi looks at Zachary with pity, and I wonder if he's thinking about taking him home like one of his adopted dogs. How is your food supply? Fine. As you can see, I'm not starving. Sheriff Levi turns to leave. Well, you fellas stay and get acquainted. Maybe you could invite Zachary to pal around with you. I try to picture Zachary riding a bike or climbing on top of a bullorama, but the bike tires flatten and the ladder steps to, to the roof break. The sheriff's hand rests on the doorknob. Mr. Beaver, you enjoy your stay in Antler, but I hope your friend returns by the end of next week. I truly hope he does. And one more thing, you can expect a visit from the doctor about that foot. The sheriff leaves and Zachary smirks at the closed door. Ooh, he's got me shaking in my boots. I want to tell him how lucky he is that the sheriff hasn't hauled his butt off to New York City. Instead, I hold out the sack of bell peppers and green onions to Zachary. I brought you some vegetables. They're from my dad's garden. The refrigerator is behind you, Zachary says. In Antler, it's considered rude to order people around and not even say thank you for a gift. But I remember his parents are dead. If I were an orphan, I probably wouldn't have any manners. I expect an empty refrigerator, but it's stocked with food. Among the eggs, cheese, and milk is a bolorama barbecue plate and a chicken delight casserole covered in plastic wrapping. Ferris must have already visited Zachary, and there is only one person in Antler who makes chicken delight casserole, Miss Murdy, May Pruitt. Just when I think there isn't anything I don't know about boring Antler, something happens and takes me by surprise. Zachary sneezes so loud it sounds like the roof could cave in. It sure gets dusty here quick, he said. It's the wind, I explain. It blows all the time. Zachary points to the light fixture. Could you dust that? I hurt my back picking up the glass. No sweat, Cal says, since he's the only one who can reach it. A second later, Zachary has me dusting the end table. He's bossy and grumpy, and if I didn't give it any thought earlier, I've decided I don't much like Zachary Beaver, but the dusting is the least I can do considering I broke the window. Cal dusts the lower bookshelf while trying to take a peek at the albums. I can reach that, Zachary snaps. With a shrug, Cal leaves the cloth on the shelf. Hey, this is neat. He grabs a book titled Sideshows. That's Polly's, Zachary growls. Put it back. Slowly, Cal returns the book to the shelf. Are you in there? Nope. Who's in there? A bunch of old acts. Most of the people are dead or retired. But one day, I'll be in a book. How's that, I ask, thinking about what Cal and I discovered at the library. One day, Polly and I will both be in a book because we're going to have the big, biggest sideshow business ever. I force a laugh. You mean the smallest. You're only one act. Not for long, Zachary says. Maybe Polly Rankin is really out drumming up more business. Maybe he's looking for a two-headed person or a turtle man. Who usually does the cleaning for you, I ask. Polly, what do you cowboys do around here for fun? We're not cowboys, I snap, wondering why I'm, I was helping this guy who thinks he's such a big shot. 
isn't this Texas where the buffaloes roam and the deer and the antelope play? I throw down the dust rag. Not everybody in Texas has a ranch. What do your parents do then? Cow flops on the floor. My dad grows cotton. Toby's dad is the postmaster, but he also raises worms. My ears burn. Zachary laughs. Worms? Yeah, worms, I say. It's not like he travels around in a trailer and charges people to look at him or anything. I expect him to snap back, but he rubs his chin. And what do people do with worms? My mouth opens and I repeat all the things Dad has ever bored me with about worms. Worms are being used in Florida to help break down landfills, and their soil makes some of the richest fertilizer on the earth. Cal's mom uses it on her roses, and she grows some of the best in ant in Texas, and mostly people use them for fishing, says Cal. I want to bust his lip. I know I'm trying to make my dad sound as important as the United States president. Some French people eat worms, Zachary says. I know that, I say, but really, I've never heard of anything more ridiculous. You like to shoot cans, Cal asks. Shoot cans, is that what you do around here for fun? Well, what do you do for fun besides watching TV and reading, I ask him. Zachary smirks. Nothing around here, but I've done plenty. Like what, I ask, and the way he meets my gaze, he knows I'm challenging him. Like ride the elevator to the top of the Eiffel Tower and cross the London Bridge and look out the top of Seattle Space Needle. When we leave, Zachary adds, oh, don't forget your bikes. You left them by the Bolorama yesterday. Outside the trailer, I ask Cal why Zachary didn't squeal on us. Maybe he has a few secrets of his own. What do you mean, I ask? Well, for one thing, Polly Rankin. I think Zachary knows where he's at, and we already know he's probably not the fattest boy in the world. And then there's that Bible. He said his mom gave it to him when he was baptized. So, Iola Beaver, I guess that's his mom, gave him the Bible. Her name is in there, but the baptism information is blank. If you're given a Bible when you're baptized, wouldn't that be the first blank you filled in? It doesn't make sense. And for once, Cal does.